Hello and welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today we will be talking about carbon fiber. What is so great about carbon fiber? So first off, what is carbon fiber? Carbon fiber, or fibers, are threads of fiber 5 to 10 micrometers in diameter, so very small, that are mostly made of carbon. The atoms are bonded together in crystals aligned lengthwise. This gives high strength to volume ratio. It's a very strong unidirectional strength. Several thousand of these fibers are bonded together to make something called a toe. These toes can be used by themselves, but are typically woven into fabrics. So carbon fabrics have very high stiffness, high tensile strength, low weight, high chemical resistance, high temperature tolerance, and low thermal expansion. So they're very strong, they're hard to pull apart, they're lightweight, they resist a lot of erosive chemicals, they can resist very high temperatures, and even when under those high temperatures, they don't change much in size. Carbon fibers are very popular in the aerospace industry, in civil engineering projects, in the military, and many sports. You have probably heard of carbon fibers because you've seen them on golf clubs, or racing bikes, or even things like canoes. So you may have seen carbon fibers around, but why don't we see them everywhere if they're so great? Well, first of all, carbon fiber is expensive. It typically costs around $10 a pound for automotive applications, whereas steel is less than a dollar a pound. So you're talking 10 times the cost. Many consumers aren't willing to pay this increased price. So therefore, manufacturing plants don't want to spend all this money making thousands of products or millions of products that are 10 times as expensive. There is good news, though. As with many things, the costs are decreasing. Even a few decades ago, carbon fiber was $35 a pound. Before that, it could be upwards of $150 when it was exclusively used by NASA and the aerospace industry. These decreasing prices will probably lead to more widespread adoption. It's currently 2016 when I'm recording this video, and you're already starting to see carbon fiber in things like wallets and cell phone cases, so decreasing costs really are helping adoption. In terms of mass production, BMW is the first automotive manufacturer to use a large amount of carbon fiber in a volume production car, so a car that's being produced on a very high scale not just like a luxury car that you only make five or 10,000 of a year. And it's significant because they're using a large amount of carbon fiber, not just one small component. So how great is it really though, looking at the numbers? Well, for example, BBC, British Broadcasting Company, did a video comparing two drive shafts that you would find in a car, one steel and one carbon fiber. They put them under torque and the carbon fiber one took around three times the force before it started twisting under the torque force. So the steel drive shaft took 1,376 newton meters of force to twist, whereas the carbon fiber drive shaft took 4,728 newton meters. Now furthering this amazing fact is, although they were the same shape, the carbon fiber shaft would have been considerably lighter than the steel shaft, at least five times lighter. So you have carbon fiber that can be three times as strong in many aspects as steel while also being five times as light. So that truly is amazing. Looking at the modulus of elasticity, the stiffness for carbon fiber, it's around 138 gigapascals. Steel is around 180, so a little bit more, but it weighs much more. As I mentioned briefly earlier, Carbon fiber has a very strong unidirectional strength. Uh, there are things called weaves that seek to minimize this and make it strong in different directions. There are difficulties with carbon fiber, especially in manufacturing, if you're trying to do this on a large scale. When you hear carbon fiber, people are typically talking about composites, so carbon fiber with some sort of resin injected into it to help it hold a shape. So typically, carbon fabrics are put into a mold, injected with a resin, heated up, and then pressure is applied. This helps the carbon fiber hold its shape and take a permanent form. It's called a composite because it's multiple things coming together. It's carbon fabric, 
made up of many fibers combined with some sort of plastic or other material known as a resin. So there are many different ways to combine resins and fibers in practice. One way that I was familiar with when I worked at a small composites facility was vacuum assisted resin transfer molding. This involves putting a mold under a vacuum and then using that vacuum to have the atmosphere outside, so not under a vacuum, push the resin through the mold. It's useful for those without an expensive autoclave, and an autoclave is just a big fancy oven that you can change the pressure in, or those wishing to make more complex parts without having to buy a highly expensive reusable mold. The problem with these processes arises when the current modeling programs and design engineers lack the experience and or capabilities to effectively design carbon fiber parts that perform as they are intended to. The experiences I've had in manufacturing really do lead me to believe that carbon fiber and composites in general are very finicky compared to most types of manufacturing. There's all sorts of these little rules and tips and tricks from the type of spray you use, how you set the fabrics in the mold, how you vary the temperatures and pressure that make manufacturing carbon fiber composites very tricky and expensive. The people I worked with at the composites facility, those who were experts at it, had years of practical experience dealing with composites. They knew a lot of these tips and tricks, but the problem a lot of times was it was hard to explain or they couldn't get it out on paper very well. And when it comes to industrial engineering, so increasing process efficiency and just streamlining operations, it's very bad if you don't have a standard approach to manufacturing things. So that is the big problem that I've seen personally with composites. Imagine most typical types of manufacturing as a set recipe for making a cake. There could be a lot of steps and a lot of little details, but if you follow them pretty well, you're going to make the cake. Now imagine with composites that it's a much bigger recipe for a cake, and a lot of the steps can vary based on your setting or the tools you're using, or they may not even behave the same day to day. And that's not to say that composites don't have an exact science behind them, they do. It's just a new area that we're currently having a lot of difficulties with. But over time, a lot of these difficulties are going away. And that's why the cost of composites is coming down so dramatically. One example of a program that has helped overcome a lot of these problems was called Hypersizer. So it could help engineers more effectively analyze these scenarios. But it had an issue too. Importing and exporting files into it from some of the more common software platforms for engineers was very difficult, you know, so that would create bottlenecks a lot of times for high production parts. But as carbon fiber is becoming more mainstream, you have a lot of well-known software companies such as AutoCAD acquiring some smaller companies so that they can incorporate these analyzing capabilities into their own products. And this is only a good thing for design engineers and manufacturing facilities. So you hear a lot about carbon fiber and fiberglass, but what are some other types of composites? And what are some specific types of carbon fiber and fiberglass themselves? Well, here's a general term, prepreg. If you ever hear that, that means fiber that is already impregnated with a resin. So it already has some resin in it. This really helps simplify the creation process when it comes to composites. You might hear unidirectional, this means that the fibers in a fabric are only going in a single direction, which can be really good for some applications and not what you need for others. So for those applications where you need strength in multiple directions, we have weaves. And these can be angled as well, so 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, those are all typical. Oftentimes as well, fabrics are designated by the amount of fibers they have. So 1,000, 3,000, 6,000, 12,000, etc. I think it's important to point out too, when you hear composites, a lot of times you think fancy race boats are really advanced scientists and materials. But plywood, for example, is a composite. It's just different types of wood glued together for additional strength at a lighter weight. And that dates back to 3400 BC or BCE. Concrete as well as a composite, so they're not always these advanced aerospace materials. But if we are talking advanced materials, fiberglass has a few different types based on the chemicals and the elements involved. So when buying fiberglass, you'll typically hear E-glass, S-glass, 
a glass. Another type of composite you'll hear about frequently are aramids. Now, they're typically known by their brand names. You've heard of Kevlar, perhaps, Bulletproof Vests. That's a type of aramid. Same with Nomex, which you see more in clothing. Thank you so much for watching this Beginning Engineers video. If you liked it, please subscribe. I'll be doing a few of these videos a week for the summer of 2016, covering a variety of engineering topics, with a focus in process engineering. I hope you now understand the basics of carbon fiber, its costs, and why it's so beneficial. Have a great day!